was an independent inquiry set up by the Welsh government to expose the truth about the death of a 10-year-old child. It led to an unprecedented apology to the boy's grieving parents from the First Minister to 23 years of failings by the authorities. But Cowan Jones concealed 18 sections of the report. And tonight, we ask why. The whole inquiry, in my view, is a farce. Unfortunately, the reductions have destroyed the real value of having an independent inquiry because it's been shown not to be independent of With criticism growing, Carolyn Jones has spoken to us to defend the report. What I wanted was to get the full picture. and I don't think anybody reading the report would think that uh, it was anything other than uh, a damning indictment of what happened. <laughs> This is Robbie Powell, a 10-year-old boy who loved life and made friends easily. He would now be 32 years old. But instead of seeing their son grow up, his family has spent more than 20 years looking to expose the truth about what happened to him. I promised Robbie in his deathbed that I would find out what had happened, and I will fulfil that promise. I'll take my last breath doing so. Wales This Week has been covering this story for more than two decades. For Robbie Powell's family, it has been a painful journey. But the latest twist is a dramatic one and goes to the heart of the Welsh political establishment. It shows that First Minister Carwyn Jones, himself a barrister, chose to conceal significant parts of a recent Welsh government inquiry into Robbie's death and the events that followed it. The independent person that conducted this review, himself a distinguished barrister, well knows what the law is and he evidently reflected upon it and decided that it accorded with the law to put those passages in. So it is just nonsense to say that they've been removed for legal reasons. The story starts in December 1989, when Robbie Powell was brought here to Morriston Hospital in Swansea, suffering from severe stomach pains and vomiting. He was treated by consultant paediatrician Dr William Forbes. It was noted that Robbie needed a simple test for a rare but treatable condition called Addison's disease. But he recovered on a drip, and his parents, Will and Diane, were told he was suffering from gastroenteritis. Then, on April the 1st, 1990, Robbie complained of a sore throat and a sore jaw. On April the 2nd, Will Powell took Robbie to their local health centre in Ustrud Gunlice, where he saw Dr Elwyn Hughes the partner who had originally referred Robbie to hospital the previous December. The doctor examined Robbie without reference to his previous medical records and could not find anything wrong with him. Then, on April the 6th, after Robbie was sent home ill from school, his father again took him to the health centre. This time they saw another GP, Dr Nicola Flower. But she said she couldn't find anything wrong with him. And she wasn't worried about them. His health, he seemed to be in good health. And she admits again she didn't read the medical records. On April the 11th, because Robbie was weak and vomiting, his parents took him to the surgery once again. This time they saw Dr Mike Williams. Looked in the medical records, read them, told us, I'm going to refer him straight back to Dr Forbes. Although we can't see anything wrong with him, the boy is obviously ill. Over the next four days, in the judgment of his parents, Robbie's condition was getting steadily worse. He could not eat and was vomiting froth. On April the 15th, Easter Sunday, Robbie saw Dr Paul Bolatz. He said Robbie should have a blood test after the holiday. The next day, Robbie was worse, and the Powells called Dr Keith Hughes out to their house. It was Easter Monday. He thought at that time there's a possibility that Robert would have to go into hospital. If he didn't keep his fluids down or his condition deteriorated, then I was to phone him back and he would admit Robert to hospital. In a fortnight, five different doctors had seen Robbie Powell. Only one had reviewed Robbie's medical records and he had told the parents he was referring Robbie back to the hospital. 
the referral letter would never be sent. On Tuesday, April the 17th, Robbie's parents became desperate about his condition. I picked him up from bed because he was so weak. I had to hold him up, took him to the bathroom, and as I took him in, he collapsed on the floor. The family called the surgery. Dr Nicola Flower came out to the house at half past three on Tuesday, April the 17th. She did not have Robbie's medical notes with her. So I asked again to have Robert admitted to hospital. She said, there's no need. There's no need for the boy to go to hospital. And I said, well, why did Keith Hughes say if he gets any worse yesterday, or if he, you know, if he vomits, that he should go in? Oh, no, there's no need at all. There's no need. The parents were so worried, they rang the hospital and spoke to a nurse on Robbie's former ward. She told me, look, Mr Powell, if the GP has just been there, you've got to believe in your GP. But if you're at all worried, phone her up again. So he did. And Dr. Flower returned to the family's home at half past five that afternoon. Again, she'd not referred to Robbie's medical notes. She said later she asked around the surgery following her first visit to the house, but the notes could not be found. She comes in with marches upstairs to Robert. Tell him he's got abdominal pain. Oh, can't find nothing wrong. He's okay. There's no need. I said, "Would you mean that? I mean the boy seriously? I said he should go to hospital. No, there's no need for that child to be in hospital." I said, look at my wife, she's in a hell of a state. Look at the state we're in because we're so worried about her. Or to put your wife's mind at rest, we'll send them in. She started writing the referral note to the hospital. And as she was finishing it off, my husband came downstairs and he asked her if she'd had an ambulance. And she just threw the note across like that. She said, no, she said, taken by car. The couple drove down to the hospital with Robbie. The staff soon realised his condition was serious and they began frantic efforts to revive him. Mr and Mrs Powell were with Robbie as he waited for a scan. I looked at him and he just said, so long and I hope he'll be OK in the scan and forever. And then we left Robert there and he was taken for a scan. Um, within a short period of time, the doctor came in and said, Mr Powell, I'm very sorry, Robert has died which was, um, what it was. Robbie died on April the 17th, 1990, at Morriston Hospital. He'd been suffering from Addison's disease, a treatable hormonal deficiency, and in the four months to his death, many opportunities had been missed to diagnose it. Over the years, there have been several investigations into the care Robbie Powell received, but none of these has provided the family with satisfaction. When Carolyn Jones became First Minister, he wrote to the UK government for permission to include the actions of the police and CPS in a public inquiry. It refused. So Mr Jones set up a non-statutory independent inquiry to be conducted by a leading barrister, Nicholas David Jones. Unlike a public inquiry, it would not be able to force witnesses to give evidence. When the report was published last July, Carolyn Jones issued an apology on behalf of the Welsh Government for the failures in the system which led to Robbie's death. What we see is a catalogue, a catalogue of errors, a catalogue of sometimes bad luck, but above all else, a catalogue of neglect. Robbie and his family have clearly been failed, let down badly by a system that should have been there to protect them. Mr and Mrs Powell have pursued their quest for information with persistence and vigour and having read this report, their anger is justified. They are owed an apology. Robbie's father, Will, who has won national awards for the work he's done to uncover the truth about Robbie's death, was digesting the report as Carolyn Jones spoke. In the end of February of uh, 2012, that report was submitted by the barrister to the First Minister. He then released it on the 17th of July, some three or four months later, and we were given it the morning that it was uh, made public. As he launched the report, Carwin Jones informed the National Assembly that there were a substantial number of legal issues surrounding it. Uh, the report was gone through in very, very fine detail. I can inform members that the approach I took to the report was that it should be as open as possible. 
uh, and that meant ensuring that the, the fullest picture was uh, made available to the Powell family and to the public when the report was uh, issued. Therefore, the number of redactions uh, is, uh, is small. The redactions were sections of text that had been blocked out of the final report. Robbie's family and the public were never meant to see what was written there. But Will Powell was about to make an astonishing discovery. By downloading Nicholas David Jones's report in a certain way, he found that he was able to see everything that had been removed. So I then wrote to the First Minister, not telling him I knew what the redactions were, but asking him to confirm under what part of the Data Protection Act had he withheld that particular information. And he wrote back and he said that he'd done it lawfully. For 20 years, Will Powell has had the support of barrister Dr Michael Powers QC, a former doctor and expert in medical negligence cases. Will showed him what he'd discovered. Well, I suppose I was uh, initially shocked that there were any redactions. We have to start on the principle that Mr Jones had been given the responsibility uh, a remit to investigate all of the relevant circumstances. Uh, that the Welsh Assembly and the First Minister had uh, evidently placed their confidence in a, in a senior barrister as being able to review effectively and decide what he should put in and what he should leave out of his inquiry report. And one wouldn't expect in a circumstance like that to have any political interference in it at all. It's supposed to be an independent report. Wales This Week can reveal what was redacted from the report. One redaction is the removal of the verdict of the coroner's jury. This is a matter of public record, which was even referred to in newspapers covering the launch of the report itself. Nicholas David Jones recorded the verdict of the inquest jury in his report. On the 30th of April 2004, the jury returned a verdict of death by natural causes and neglect contributed to the cause of death. This was redacted. Dr Michael Powers QC is an expert in coroner's law. Probably the most astonishing redaction of all. And there can be no possible reason for the redaction of that factual account from the inquiry. Absolutely astonishing. The doctors felt at the time that the jury had, to a degree, vindicated them by not saying it was due to their personal neglect that Robbie had died. Robbie's family were unhappy with the inquest because it did not pinpoint precisely who had failed him. In his description of Dr Nicola Flower's visit to the house on the day of Robbie's death, Nicholas David Jones recorded, Mr and Mrs Powell requested that Robbie be referred to Morriston Hospital. There was a heated discussion. Dr Flower refused to admit him, saying that there was no need. The finding that there was a heated discussion, which has been reported in Wales this week previously, was removed from the final report. The doctors provided a written response to questions posed by the barrister compiling the report, apart from Dr Williams and Dr Bolatz. Nicholas David Jones recorded, They each instructed their solicitor to make no comment. This too was redacted from the report when it was made public. The family says the public has the right to know who contributed to the report. Back in the 1990s, David Powers Police did investigate Robbie Powell's death. But in 1996, on the advice of the Crown Prosecution Service, it wrote to lawyers acting for the GPs to say that no further action would be taken. This police letter has been the source of much controversy. Calvin Jones himself referred to this letter when launching the Welsh Government report into Robbie's death. On the face of it, it seems that the police in David Powers in, uh, in 1996 gave an assurance to people they were themselves investigating that those people would not be prosecuted. That is an exceptionally serious matter. Ten years ago, the David Powers police inquiry was investigated by officers from Avon and Somerset Police. They found that David Powers had failed to investigate professionally, efficiently and effectively, and had been institutionally incompetent. In 2003, the Crown Prosecution Service looked again at the case. The inquiry report states that the CPS found that there was insufficient evidence to prosecute any doctor for manslaughter. 
but that there was sufficient evidence to prosecute Dr. Williams for the alleged forgery of a referral letter. There was also evidence to prosecute Dr. Nicola Flower for forgery in respect of medical notes of her visits to Robbie's house on the day he died. And there was evidence to prosecute both doctors for attempting to pervert the course of justice. A lawyer for Dr. Flower told us that the CPS's conclusions were strongly disputed and wholly rejected. Dr. Williams has always taken a similar stance. The CPS decided it was no longer in the public interest to prosecute these doctors because of the passage of time and because of their earlier decisions not to prosecute. The inquiry report concludes that issues relating to Dr. Flower's medical notes and Dr. Williams' referral letter have not been formally determined. In the months after Robbie Powell's death, the five Ustragunlice doctors met with consultant paediatrician Dr. William Forbes, who treated him four months before he died. The Powell family and the doctors have always been in dispute about what may have been discussed at the meeting. No record was kept of that meeting. In fact, Robbie's family only discovered it had taken place when they appealed against the decision by West Glamorgan Family Practitioner Committee not to take any action against the GPs. The fact that this meeting happened has long been in the public domain. In 1992, Wales This Week reconstructed some of Dr Forbes' evidence to the Powell's unsuccessful appeal to the Welsh office. So there were five doctors present. When did it take place? Well, I cannot remember exactly when it took place. You are totally unable to help? Totally unable to help you. Can you tell us when it took place? Yes, the meeting took place at Morriston Hospital. Would you tell us how often it is that five general practitioners come together for a meeting with you to discuss a death which has occurred several months earlier? I think that would be a unique occasion. The meeting was dealt with in paragraph 122 of the original report. This paragraph, or reference to this meeting, has been redacted by the First Minister. I can't ever imagine the situation in which every uh, partner in a general practice goes to a hospital consultant to have an unminuted meeting about the circumstances of a death. This, of course, was partly investigated by Mr Jones in his report. It was put into his report, and someone's taken it out. What possible reason could there be for its removal? Now, with full knowledge of what had been taken out of the report, Will Powell entered into an exchange of letters and emails with Carolyn Jones without revealing he knew what was contained in the redactions. Carolyn Jones then made it quite clear in a letter to Will Powell dated September the 4th, 2012, that he had had the last word on what was blanked out from the report. As I have said before, it was always my intention to represent as full a picture as possible. It was with this in mind that I took the final decision regarding any redactions. Carolyn Jones also revealed to Will Powell that both David Powers Police and the GP solicitors had been able to view the parts relating to them more than two months before the report's publication. A limited number of representations were received and considered, wrote the First Minister. This left Will Powell and his barrister with concerns. So when it became apparent that the redactions were relevant, it became all the more surprising that they should have been taken out of the report. This is just, I'm afraid, a, a serious misjudgment at the very least. Well, I can only see one motivation regarding the redactions, and that was that it was the damage limitation exercise, which is absolutely scandalous in my view, because that was the whole point of me having an inquiry. We asked Calvin Jones to explain why he'd made individual redactions. He refused, but he was prepared to talk to us about the report in general terms. What was your approach when making those redactions from the report, and what were your reasons behind the redactions? I would have preferred to have published an unredacted report. Uh, I want to be as uh, open as possible. But there were some parts of the report that, for various reasons, such as the fact that evidence had been supplied to us under a duty of confidence, some data protection issues, some issues regarding the law of libel that uh, some 
uh, paragraphs were taken out, but I don't believe they detract in any way from the truly shocking story that the report actually illustrates. It's been put to us that the redactions amount to political interference with an independent or so-called independent report. How would you respond to that? I can't accept that. I mean, what for? And what's the point of interfering with the report? The report has to be as, as open as, as, as possible, and that, I believe, is what's been been done. Bear in mind that it wasn't open to me to rewrite or change any of the report. It was simply a question of, is this in or is this out? It couldn't be rewritten in any way. But the big question for me is not what's happened. We know what's happened. It's appalling. I mean, no one can argue if they read the report that, that the way things were done, uh, truly shocking. The question for me is what happens next? Now, what I'm doing is pursuing two matters. First of all, I've asked the General Medical Council to investigate. Uh, even after this time, I think it's important that investigation takes place. Secondly, I've been writing to the police and the CPS uh, with a view to obtaining an explanation as to why somebody seems to have given an immunity from prosecution to a group of doctors. I think that's absolutely scandalous if that happened, and I want to know who did it and on what basis that was done. However, the doctors have always maintained that they did nothing wrong. The report concludes that the adequacy of the care and treatment provided by each of the GPs has not been properly and formally considered and determined in each case. Nicholas David-Jones said these issues fell outside the remit of his investigation. Will Powell and his barristers say the independent report has been completely undermined by the redactions. They believe the only way forward is a public inquiry into Robbie Powell's death. I think the appointment of a, uh, an independent non-statutory inquiry was a means of taking the, the steam out of the system, took the pressure out of the system, um, and might have achieved it but for these redactions. And unfortunately, the redactions have destroyed the real value of having an independent inquiry because it's been shown not to be independent anymore. What Mr Powell would like, because he said this to me, is he like a public inquiry with the police and the CPS there. Now, I can't give him that. The police and the CPS are not the responsibility of the Welsh Government, and so we can't compel them to be part of an inquiry. I did write to the Attorney-General, and I asked the Attorney-General to allow the police and the CPS to be part of an inquiry, and the answer was no. It's just so sad that there's nobody out there willing to help. You know, there's nobody out there willing to properly investigate it. And as far as I'm concerned, it's not acceptable. There has to be a public inquiry.